Good afternoon, everyone. The webcast is about to begin. Please note this call is being recorded. Society of Cardiovascular Magnetic Residents, please present this webinar, Stress Perfusion CMR in the 2021 ACC AHA Chest Pain Guidelines. My name is Ryan Smith, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Please note that today's call is being recorded, and all participant lines will be muted during the broadcast. Today's presentation will last up to 60 minutes and include a specific question and answer period. However, you can enter a question for us at any time during today's presentation. You may submit a question by typing it into the Q&A box in the lower center of the window. Then be sure to click on the sub button located next to the box. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Suba Rahman, who will introduce today's speakers. Please go ahead, Suba. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, thank you all for being here. My name is Suba Rahman. I'm the current president for the Society for Cardiovascular Magnetic Resonance. I'm thrilled to be joined by uh, Dr. Sven Plein, the incoming president for our society, and Dr. Purvi Parwani from Loma Linda, California, both exemplars in the field in their own right. Uh, Purvi is representing our early career membership. We have some outstanding speakers that my colleague Sven will now introduce. Well, thank you, Suba. It's my privilege to introduce two fantastic speakers for this webinar. We have uh, first up John Greenwood, who's professor of cardiology in the US of Leeds. Uh, he's also the current president of the British Cardiovascular Society, and he was uh, the SCMR representative on the uh, writing panel for uh, the current guidelines. Uh, this will be followed by Raymond Kwong, who's professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and director of CMR at the Brigham, uh, Brigham's and Women's. But first up is John, who's going to give us an overview of what the new guidelines actually are all about. John, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Sven. Um, let me just quickly share my screen, if that's possible. Please tell me if it's not working. Can everybody see and hear me? Oh, good, John. Oh, that's great. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the guidelines. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest, other than, as Sven said, I was on the writing group um, as the SCMR representative. I think the thing I'd just like to point out, first of all, is that writing guidelines is actually really quite tricky. Um, and you, probably many of you will have seen this paper that shows that really the underpinning evidence of much of what is quoted and recommended in guidelines um, is based on quite limited data. And you can see here from ACC and the SC guidelines that it varies between about eight and 14% of recommendation, recommendations only actually have the level of evidence of class A, which is the highest level of evidence from generally randomized controlled trials. So it is always a challenge. And I'll just take you back very quickly to 2012. This was the last set of ACC AHA chest pain guidelines. And you can see the indications for CMR were very, very minimal, really. There were two scenarios where it was a potential recommendation. That was in patients who were able to exercise but had an uninterpretable ECG and were intermediate to high risk. That got a 2A. And then the other scenario where patients were unable to exercise but also had intermediate to high risk and other two-way indications. So really these guidelines were very much predicated around treadmill testing and nuclear perfusion imaging and stress echo were class one recommendations where CMR were only class two. And that's because this was prior to the four big randomized controlled trials in CMR and stable coronary disease and also the US multicenter spins registry. I'd just like to sort of point out as well, I know there's a lot of misinterpretation around recent randomized controlled trials, and some people now think ischemia testing may not be that relevant, but that really isn't the case to the large body of cardiologists around the world. And if you look at the latest ESC guidelines around revascularization and the treatment of ischemia, there isn't a single indication for revascularization without the demonstrable evidence of ischemia, whether that's from a non-invasive uh, imaging test, or whether that's from invasive FFR. So again, just before I talk about the 21 guidelines from AHA ACC, I thought I'd just really quickly put them into context with the UK NICE guidelines and the ESC guidelines. 
a bit of a busy slide, but this is the 2016 uh, chest pain guidelines from the UK. And I think it's fair to say that uh, the majority of cardiologists don't particularly like the guidelines as they're written and certainly don't follow them in practice. And that's been borne out by uh, survey and audit studies. Um, you can see that the guidelines are relatively conventional in terms of assessing the patient's symptoms, uh, uh, history and examination, doing an ECG, and then they go on to diagnostic imaging investigations, which in the NICE guidelines are CT for anybody with de novo chest pain and typical or atypical angina. CT is the only first line test. If that's been uncertain uh, in terms of its significance or is non-diagnostic, then you can consider functional imaging by any of um, the modalities I've highlighted here. And only then uh, consider invasive coronary angiography as a third line test. In patients who have got known coronary disease, then the, the first line recommendation is a functional imaging test um, rather than an anatomical test. So that's the UK guidelines. I think it's fair to say, just looking at those really quickly as well, is that there hasn't been a single randomized controlled trial that has shown head-to-head -head anatomical versus uh, functional testing for one strategy to be superior over another. There is big meta-analyses of all the trials, and again, they don't show superiority. Um, they may show reductions in non-fatal MI with anatomical imaging, usually because of increased use of primary prevention treatments like aspirin and statins. But the trade-off is that is there's no reduction in mortality, no reduction in hospitalization, and there's increased angiography rates and increased revascularization. So lots of things that are expensive, but with no increased patient benefit. Let's look really quickly at the European guidelines. These are thought to be very pragmatic and quite sensible. These came out in 2019. Again, assess the patient and then do some form of pretest probability assessment with a more recent calibrated uh, risk model. Um, and then on the basis of the patient's pretest probability, take a pragmatic view um, looking at if your risk is very low, you might consider no diagnostic testing. If you're sort of low to intermediate risk, then uh, CTCA, which is a really good rule out test, might be the appropriate first line test. If you're a higher risk, then perhaps you're more likely to have ischemia, more likely to need revascularization, so perhaps a functional imaging test. Um, and if you're really high risk, perhaps a straight to uh, invasive coronary angiography as the first line test. And I think these are quite sensible because they leave it very much in the hands of the patient and the physician saying that there is a class one indication for an anatomical or a functional test. Uh, and that's very much predicated around local expertise and availability of testing. So let's have a look at the AHA ACC guidelines, which as you know, came out on Thursday last week. The first thing to say is that these guidelines um, split the two clinic the clinical scenarios of acute chest pain out from stable chest pain. And they have this sort of pyramid approach to uh, the potential for investigations and make it quite clear that in asymptomatic or very low risk patients, then perhaps a no testing strategy is the most appropriate first line choice. Uh, only in, in limited cases might you want to go down a treadmill or calcium score testing. And really imaging is reserved for intermediate and high risk groups, uh, whether that's acute or stable chest pain. And in the very high risk, uh, unstable patients, then a direct to cath approach is perhaps the most appropriate. So let's have a look at the uh, evaluation of patients with acute chest pain according to these guidelines. So this really just emphasizes what I just shown on that pyramid is that we really want to look at possible patients with acute coronary syndromes based on history, troponin, ECG, using an appropriate risk stratification tool, which there are a number uh, internationally. And it's looking very much at this intermediate risk group these are the ones where further diagnostic imaging is the appropriate uh, um, first line test, if you like. High risk groups, it's a direct to cat, low risk groups, it may be no testing required. So if we look now at this intermediate risk group with no known coronary artery disease, what you can see here is 
um, if we look at the, if they've not had prior testing, so these are a de novo presentation, you get a class one recommendation for functional imaging, functional testing, and also a class one recommendation for anatomical testing with CT. And then they go down, depending on what the result of those tests, whether they're negative, moderate, or inconclusive, and the same with CT, you get a sort of sequential testing approach whereby you may want to do a second line test if the first one has been inconclusive or borderline. In patients who've had a prior anatomical test, whether that's an invasive angiogram or a prior CT where there's just minor atheroma being previously demonstrated, then these guidelines recommend a second anatomical test, typically by uh, CT, coronary angiography, um, and that may be followed up if that's been inconclusive or shows some evidence of significant obstructive disease by functional testing, typically by imaging, but perhaps maybe controversially to some uh, now includes uh, FFRCT. And these are the specific recommendations. This really just over underpins what was said in the, the diagrammatic algorithm in that you have a 1A recommendation for anatomical testing, but also a one a class one recommendation for functional testing, which can include exercise treadmill testing or all of the different imaging modalities, but not quite a, uh, an A in the ED setting. This was a, considered to be a B non-randomized um, recommendation. And then if you want to consider layered testing after an indeterminate anatomical or an indeterminate uh, ischemia test, uh, then that's a 2A recommendation. And it's the same whether you go for anatomical first or functional first. It's still a 2A recommendation, expert opinion. So what about those patients who are acute intermediate risk but now have known coronary artery disease? Well, the other algorithm now splits around whether that known coronary artery disease was minor or moderate to severe. And if it's previously known minor atheroma, so minimal plaque, then again, a fun an anatomical approach first with the caveat that if obstructive disease is found, then to go down a functional testing route. But if it was minor atheroma previously, then again, now a functional imaging approach as the first line test. And you can see that anatomical and functional imaging both get a 2A recommendation uh, before going on through layered testing, ultimately potentially down to invasive coronary angiography. And this is just the specific verbiage around those recommendations. You can see here um, a 2A recommendation for both anatomical uh, and functional imaging uh, recommendations. Um, and that now doesn't include exercise treadmill testing because this is known coronary artery disease. So it's felt that imaging strategies are better than treadmill strategies in patients with known anatomical disease or functional disease. There are some caveats as well, some interesting other additional recommendations. So this is a group of patients who present acutely with known prior CABG, and you can see both stress imaging and anatomical imaging gets a class one recommendation. Level of evidence C, so not particularly high because of limited data. And acute aortic syndromes, I guess not surprising that perhaps CT is the most appropriate choice of imaging test here, but interesting that now CMR is recommending where, um, where CT is either contraindicated or unavailable. So let's look at um, the acute group with, sorry, my screen is just um, with moderate disease. So, you, sorry, with um, myopericarditis. Um, you can see now we have specific recommendations for CMR uh, in patients with Minoka, where you might want to distinguish myopericarditis from either myocarditis, uh, myocardial infarction, so um, occult myocardial infarction or, or non-obstructive coronary artery disease, where perhaps there's been spontaneous reperfusion. Um, and specifically, CMR is a class one recommendation in, in this scenario. Interestingly, also, there's a CMR recommendation in acute patients who present with valvular heart disease, but this is really just restricted to those where 
transthoracic or transesophageal echo is either not available or not diagnostic. So now let's look at uh, stable chest pain presentations. And the guidelines again recommend assessing pretest probability by a contemporary risk model uh, based on age, sex, and symptoms. And I think what is important again here, very much concordant with the ESC guidelines, that if the pretest probability is felt to be of, of obstructive CAD is felt to be low, then perhaps a no testing strategy is the most appropriate way to go. This is important because the likelihood of a false positive test in these very low risk patients is more likely than having a true positive test. So first line non-testing is a reasonable approach with uh, individual, individual clinical management based on I guess, patient ongoing symptoms, whereby you then might want to consider investigation if your first line strategy has been no investigation, but they've had breakthrough symptoms. And then restricting the investigation by uh, any of our uh, non-invasive tests to this intermediate or high risk group. So let's have a look at, first of all, patients with stable chest pain and no known coronary disease. So these are the de novo chest pain uh, presentations. If you're very low risk, well, so, sorry, low risk, not very low risk, as I've said here, a no testing strategy is a class one recommendation with limited uh, investigations in a select group of patients. If you're in this intermediate to high risk group, as we've seen here, then it could be a CTCA first, or equally, it could be a stress imaging approach first. And depending on the result of stress imaging, you could go down a medical therapy um, as the first line strategy. If there was moderate to severe um, ischemia, you could go down preventative strategies, so guideline directed medical therapy, um, primary prevention, and then consider, uh, depending on breakthrough symptoms, invasive coronary angiography, or perhaps CTCA. And it's exactly the same over here on this side. If you've gone down an anatomical pathway, first of all, um, obviously you've got options if that test has been uh, inconclusive to go to stress imaging. And likewise, if that uh, investigation has shown significant obstructive disease to go down a imaging testing strategy um, as a second line layered investigation. And this just puts it into, again, into the sort of uh, verbiage recommendations in the guideline. You can see here CT class one is effective for de novo chest pain investigation at moderate to high risk and exactly the same for functional imaging, whether it's stress echo, PET, uh, MPS spec or CMR. And as I've said before, second line investigation or layered testing for breakthrough symptoms uh, in uh, in uh, borderline disease uh, could be either a anatomical if the first line test was functional or functional if the first line test was anatomical and both of those get a 2A recommendation level of evidence be non-randomized. So what about the final pathway? This is patients with stable chest pain and known coronary artery disease so either prior acute coronary syndrome, infarction, prior revascularization or known atheroma. And again, this splits up now dependent on the level of obstructive disease. If it's just minor atheroma, potentially going down, um, intensifying treatment in the first in instance um, with then the potential for um, CT or stress testing as a 2A recommendation. If it's significant obstructive disease previously, then potentially um, looking at the um, intensifying treatment first of all, and in higher risk groups, either going down a functional imaging first of all, um, or invasive catheterization with an option for a non-invasive anatomical test if, if that was preferred over uh, invasive uh, anatomical imaging. So again, both get similar and high ranking recommendations um, and both have options for layered testing. And again, you can see here um, 
Anatomical testing is a class 1A recommendation in this scenario. Uh, also a class 1 recommendation for functional imaging, which could include CMR. So pretty much equipoise between all of the imaging strategies um, with an option then for uh, 2A second line testing by the opposite of either the anatomical or functional test that was done first. Um, and again, there are um, other scenarios in particularly in CABG patients, whereby again, you've got the option to investigate by either stress imaging or anatomical imaging as a 2A level of evidence C limited data recommendation. So the final pathway I just wanted to highlight are those patients um, who are stable, but they have suspected ischemia and non-obstructed coronary arteries. Uh, there was quite a lot of debate and work done in this area. It's, it's a sort of an emerging uh, pathway and patient group with emerging evidence. But I think it's really interesting for the CMR community now because we have actually got into the guidelines as a 2A recommendation compar comparable to PET and also comparator, comparative to invasive coronary angiography with invasive coronary physiology as a 2A recommendation for stress CMR. Um, so I think that's, uh, I think that's uh, a good level of achievement based on some recent uh, observational data that has come out in the CMR literature. And I think it's also interesting to note that from a CR perspective, uh, we now have specific reference to myocardial blood flow um, uh, assessment as a reasonable technique, uh, as a 2A recommendation. So whether that's from uh, quantitative perfusion techniques with Fermi uh, uh, modeling techniques, or whether that's inline perfusion mapping uh, using techniques like um, Gastron uh, framework or other modeling techniques. So I think we've got that into the into the guideline now as a as a potentially uh, novel area with a 2A recommendation. So that's been quite uh, a gallop through, uh, I guess, four quite complex flow diagrams, two in the acute setting, two in the stable chest pain setting. But just to try and summarize this from a CMR perspective, I think if we look at acute chest pain, all of, the CMR, all of the scenarios that you can think of all now include CMR, and they are all either class one or class 2A recommendations, and actually very comparable to all of the other functional imaging tests and the anatomical imaging tests. And if we look at stable chest pain, again, all scenarios now include CMR, either as a class one or class 2A recommendation. And again, generally comparable to anatomical and all other functional imaging tests. I think the only other, the only test that has got into the guidelines that outperforms on the um, level of evidence is CT, which has a class one recommendation and also a 1A recommend, or an a, a level of evidence A recommendation. But this is big progress, I think, from CMR, from the CMR community compared to the 2012 ACC AHA guidelines. Uh, and I think, I think based on a lot of work by a lot of uh, investigators over the last 10 years has provided some really great underpinning evidence to get these as one and two A uh, recommendations. And I think it's a sort of call of arms to the rest of the community now as well to think about how can we strengthen some of these other areas uh, where there's, uh, I guess, a level of B or level of C evidence that underpins it to make these stronger and uh, potentially in the next guideline round to have some more of these as class one. So I'm happy to stop there and either take some questions or pass directly over to Raymond and then do all the questions at the end. I, I don't mind whichever is felt to be the best way of doing this. Yeah, I think John, we're going to take questions at the end uh, in the panel discussion. This was a, a fantastic overview and uh, it's it's also impressive to see the complexity of these guidelines. There's been so much, so many different scenarios. Uh, I don't envy the work that you must have put into you know, going through all of those scenarios.
Um, but really impressive to see how MR has been uplifted in a number of important clinical scenarios to, to now class one indication and how new indications have come along like ENOCA and uh, MINOCA. So a huge step forward it brings the American guidelines much more in line also with, uh, with previous European guidelines. But something we can come back to later on, uh, very keen to hear from Raymond. But before I pass over, please remember to post questions on the Q&A uh, tab. Uh, anybody who has questions from the audience, uh, don't be shy. We will try and go through as many of them as possible after Raymond's presentation. Uh, Raymond Kong now, uh, as I previously mentioned, Professor of Medicine at Harvard, and the director of CMR at the, the Brigham and Women's. Thank you very much for uh, giving a second talk, Raymond. Uh, thank you, Sven. Um, thank you very much for the SCMR for inviting me to provide this presentation. Um, so what I, what I plan to do is really uh, after the exciting and uh, really comprehensive summary uh, that John just provided on the latest guideline, I want to provide a little bit of the practical and clinical perspectives as uh, clinicians and uh, what this guideline has now changed in our practice, why it is so important to kickstart CMR program and stress CMR, not only for benefiting your patients, but also for the global uh, efficiency of uh, coronary artery disease care. Um, this is my disclosure slide. So as stable chest pain syndrome with or without a uh, uh, history of coronary artery disease. Uh, so um, as indicated here, the, um, the guideline for stable chest pain syndrome without any known history of CAD calls for clinical assessment. Uh, again, patient-centric is the key. You need to assess the patient's risk, symptoms, <laughs> and, and risk profile uh, in order to make the sound decision. The guidelines specifically indicate that uh, for patients at intermediate <clears throat> risk, uh, an atomic approach, CT, or stress, or stress testing are appropriate, but they both achieve class one. Stress MRI is now on par with all the uh, imaging modalities, including stress stress pet. Um, but for low risk patients, it's reasonable to defer testing uh, uh, first. So CMR has achieved a uh, uh, remarkably high uh, evidence. For patients with stable chest pain syndrome with known CAD, uh, C stress testing also has achieved a class one indication along with other established uh, stress imaging modalities um, for patients with <clears throat> for patients with a history of known CAD stable chest pain syndrome with no obstructive uh, history is reasonable to consider either CT first or stress MRI first depending on how you perceive the again patient centric assessment first how you perceive the likelihood of ruling out with an anatomic approach or specifically looking at the physiologic burden of ischemia, whichever that question pertain better to the patient's profile. So again, uh, these are very strong implications compared to the last uh, uh, chest pain, uh, last guideline more than uh, almost uh, nine years ago. I wanna provide a bit of context why we should, we should consider this. Uh, look, let's look at the global burden of coronary disease in the U.S. Uh, annually, about half a million patients will be diagnosed to have new coronary disease by angiography. Invasive angiography means we are in a new era now because we, now, we know that majority of these patients will do well, even if they are diagnosed to have coronary disease, they will do well on medical therapy. Uh, we... Um, Upstream from the diagnosis invasively, there are 10 million Americans annually who, will get, who get referred to have non-invasive imaging for pretty much the fear of a one to 2% chance of unstable angina or acute MI or adverse, uh, serious adverse cardiac consequences. So there is a 20 fold ratio of referral of non-invasive tests to diagnosing. So we play a really key gatekeeping role as imagers. 
to now in an era where we have really effective medical therapy that we have to highly select those patients who are symptomatic, who actually will benefit from invasive approach. And that becomes a, 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 a new uh, key issue in the management of CAD. Why is it important? Historically, for the last decades, we have not done well. Cardiologists have not done well in selecting patients to refer to invasive means. From the 2010 ACC NCDR <clears throat> um, registry, almost 400,000 patients uh, who underwent invasive angiography, it was noted that a, a, a large proportion of patients who underwent a, a invasive cath had no obstructive coronary disease. Uh, and that we, many of that were referred because of a low threshold of invasive referral, but more importantly, the test that we chose is also part of the, part of the issue. And again, as shown here, stress MRI is uh, compared to, in this metal analysis, compared to other modalities, sensitivity is important, but is no longer in, the, is no longer the key issue when we are in an era of low CAD prevalence of disease, and that we have high, uh, highly effective medical therapy. I would argue that a high test specificity, so we know for sure the patient will get some kind of benefit from an invasive referral is an important issue. As shown in, the, uh, in this large uh, meta-analysis, uh, shown here, the ability of, uh, of a test to rule uh, rule out disease, as shown here, is um, fairly good. Uh, between anatomic approach, PET, MRI, all perform fairly well. But in the era that we're in now, when there's a low disease prevalence and highly effective medical therapy, I would argue that the pretest likelihood is somewhat around this range, no longer at the 50% range, so somewhat lower. And the need to rule in the benefits of an invasive referral, meaning that the patient have symptomatic, uh, have symptoms that are truly gonna benefit a revascularization should be assessed non-invasively. And we need tests that have accurate coronary physiology to rule in the benefits of invasive referral. And in this metal analysis, it showed that CMR for sure uh, performed really well compared to other modalities in this regard. As John and his colleagues have shown in CMARC2 when they randomized uh, in a two-to-one fashion, non-invasive ima uh, non invasive stress imaging versus the nice guideline, the, because of the physiology that is provided by CMR and the high test specificity, uh, it, was, it has been shown that inappropriate referral of angiography, invasive angiography, was reduced by almost threefold in the CMR2 trial. And in further regard, our, our community has done an excellent job uh, in uh, further understanding how CMR can impact, uh, in impact patients' decision to be referred in this regard. In the well-known MR informed trial that Nago et al. and his colleagues have performed when they perform a non, uh, a non inferiority trial of almost a thousand patients who have an indication for invasive referral when they randomize patients into two groups. Uh, at one year follow up, <clears throat> it was uh, observed that both groups, patients who underwent MRI first group or patients who went to invasive referral with invasive FFR assessment, both groups uh, did not feel differently in terms of angina. Uh, they perf they uh, both groups also perform well in terms of their overall outcome. MRI certainly did not miss uh, high risk, dangerous patients, uh, but MRI was able to target and refer more proper performance of invasive angiography and performance of uh, coronary revascularization and reduce the unnecessary. Uh, reduce the use of coronary revascularization by 21%. Patients felt well, they survived okay, and they had less revascularization. So it points to <clears throat> the highly effective, uh, high effectiveness of coronary physiology as gleaned by, by stress MRI. In the, uh, on the US side, we performed the 13 center 
uh, spins registry, we, which, where we follow patients for about five years. We collected data from 13 US centers, uh, 2,347 patients. And it was shown that consistently MRI uh, without, the, without any evidence of ischemia or, or uh, infarct as shown in green here, uh, which represents about two thirds of all the patients uh, who are referred to MRI, as long as they have a negative ischemia and, and, and infarct, they perform extremely well. The incidence of, of heart, uh, adverse heart cardiac outcomes was less than 1% persistently for five years consecutively during the follow-up period. On the other hand, those who are captured to have um, abnormal ischemia and, and also uh, in combination of infarction, maybe even unrecognized infarction, they are the risky patients who probably further work up, in, including invasive and geography, and geography could be, should be entertained. <clears throat> um, the incidence or the need, uh, once the MRI was noted to be negative for ischemia and for infarction, which again, observed in 67% of the cohort, uh, it was highly effective in ruling out further clinical needs for revascularization as shown in, uh, in this bar graph for the next five years. The incidence of, re of needing revascularization was in the order of one to 3%. Some of these interventions were related to uh, persistent symptomatology, uh, but the overall rate was, ex was remarkably low. We factor in the, um, in the uh, on the ground, uh, on the best evidence based on uh, using data from SPINS, CMARC, an MR informed trial to look at can MRI be a cost effective, cost, cost effective tool in the US? And this is just one of the many uh, publications in this regard. And we focus on the US uh, um, uh, healthcare metrics. And we've, we compare uh, in a uh, Markov model, compare five different arms of stable chest pain assessment uh, as shown here. And factoring in uh, some of the detail, some of the downstream factors in terms of missing disease or diagnostic uh, inaccuracies and downstream cost of uh, uh, of further testing, and we found that MRI certainly performed very well in this uh, regard using a Markov model of cost effectiveness. CMR was shown because of its high accuracy uh, and high specificity towards revascularized towards the need for revascularization that it dominated SPEC and CT uh, scan in this analysis. So MR certainly is, is a ongoing tool that as, uh, as John has mentioned, that has achieved 2A indication for, uh, for cases where we believe that maybe a uh, small vessel uh, uh, is needed, a small vessel disease is, is present or the need for have uh, quantitative myocardial perfusion is needed. MRI certainly is progressing very well in this regard, such as uh, uh, the, the use of quantitative perfusion, which is increasingly available in our, in our field. Uh, in this case of a stress patient, you can see there is perfusion uh, defects in the area that are matching infarction as shown in the second row, but the anterior wall in this patient with stable chest pain was somewhat hard to see, Quantitative perfusion methods actually further allow us to characterize this is a hypoperfuse blue color, hypoperfuse region during stress. So allowing you to have better, more quantitative, less um, subjective approach to, uh, to analyze these data. And it certainly uh, make a big difference in this case of a unbalanced three vessel disease. And I believe that these sort of methods will continue to benefit our field. And switching gear a little bit, acute chest pain and uh, 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 acute chest pain also, as John has demonstrated, have multiple um, class one indication by MRI. Uh, a lot of these patients were admitted as an inpatient and may have suspected myocardial injury because of an abnormal troponin level. So as shown by the latest guideline, that for those patients with acute chest pain and myocardial injury, those with, uh, uh, who have been found to have a non-obstructive coronary artery disease, 
coronary, uh, uh, coronary arteries on, on anatomic testing, MRI has a class one indication to distinguish myocardi myocarditis or other etiologies of, uh, of the elevated troponin and chest discomfort. To me, this is extremely important because often these patients will have missed the diagnosis or be sent home with, uh, with, without an understanding of why they were having symptoms or a troponin leak and the consequences can be important. In my practice, I think that um, uh, beyond this, this uh, guideline, there are also patients that have just abnormal troponin that they don't need to immediately go to have an anatomic testing by invasive means or even CT. And those patients, it's actually also very reasonable to have a uh, MRI or stress MRI to further characterize the cause of their, uh, of their symptoms. And there's another class of indication came from the fact that MRI is a reliable tool in fact, a very unique tool to understand the presence and extent of myocardial or pericardial inflammation, providing information that we can actually, actually diagnose the etiology of the symptoms. Uh, so I want to show a, a case or two to illustrate this point. This is a patient that during the uh, COVID uh, pandemic I was attending to, and I had not wanted to provide a cath. Uh, on this patient. He initially came in uh, with intermittent chest pain with a troponin leak that the symptoms were atypical enough that uh, most members of the team did not think that uh, coronary disease was the cause of, of this patient. Uh, but when, as you see here, the perfusion in a very rapid scan that took about a couple of minutes and a couple of minutes of rest perfusion uh, you can clearly see that there is a uh, markedly hypoperfused antral subtal wall that is very concerning, that is reversible. The perfusion defect is, does not, does not uh, exist in, uh, at rest in the second row here. By having quantitative perfusion mapping, you can, one can appreciate that, that uh, the anterior wall is anterior and antral subtal wall are hypoperfused, confirmed by quantitation. But in addition to that, Looking back at the qualitative finding, there's a second area of hypoperfusion that was not so obvious, and it was picked up by the quantitative perfusion on the, uh, on the color mapping here. You can see the pink color or hyperemic myocardium that uh, blood flow increased, but that left behind uh, in region of hypoperfused uh, inferolateral wall, as also shown in the mid region. So um, fortunately, he does not have any area of uh, myocardial infarction and not shown here, the function is entirely normal. So as um, given this case, despite of uh, my initial uh, lack of desire to perform an angiography, I went up sending him to a, to a cath and confirm two vessel lesions. The point is that if we had, if I had sent him for an atomic testing alone, I will still be left with re questions about the cause of his chest pain and also the urgency of performing revascularization. I now know that there is no damage, heart function is otherwise normal, but there are two regions that are crying for, uh, for help because of his underlying ischemia. And I think this sort of functional physiologic testing is extremely important. Not to mention that MRI in this setting provided extensive, uh, an, an extensive uh, array of information that diagnose other non coronary disease, such as acute pericarditis, uh, perimyocarditis. Uh, in this case, the, the, uh, the, there is a remarkable amount of edema in the pericardium based on this T2-weighted imaging. And there's also, in this case, a post-op uh, myocarditis. You can see it in function in the apex with a clot in the apex. And also there is extensive pericardial inflammation. Or in the cases, some other variants of diseases that are highly relevant to treatment decisions can also be seen. This is the case of a viral, viral myocarditis affecting the infralateral wall. Another case on a more extreme case, this is another patient who came in with a, in, a, a normal troponin initially thought to have coronary disease based on echo because of a um, dysfunctional infralateral wall. It turned out that there is a mark mark evidence of, in, of inflammation and infiltration and turn out to be a giant cell myocarditis. Certainly in more extreme 
uh, clinical scenario, but we do see this array of diagnostic challenging um, uh, uh, cases uh, that will be somewhat, that will be very challenging without MR. In summary, in the current era of low CAD disease prevalence with the availability of effective medical therapies, stress MRI is a highly effective functional clinical tool to diagnose clinical, uh, to diagnose chest pain and guide proper invasive referral and, and get benefits for, uh, for uh, revascularization. In the new ACC AHA chest pain guidelines, stress CMR has a class one indication for all key clinical indications in chronic chest pain syndromes, which is on par with other stress imaging modalities, including SPECT, stress tackle, and PET. In the new ACC AHA chest pain guideline, CMR also has multiple class one indications to assess acute chest pain syndromes and assess the evidence of myocardial injury. Of course, during the context of this, my presentation, I cannot uh, mention there are other two-way indications, uh, including quantitation uh, and, um, and other scenarios. But again, this is really a exciting time for stress MRI uh, to get into uh, this modality so that your patients can get the, the maximal benefits from non-invasive uh, invasive investigation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kuang, for that fantastic presentation. Um, you know, you, you updated us uh, with the current evidence. Uh, probably the current guidelines were uh, based on that extensive evidence that uh, this modality has provided uh, hard work of many CMR imagers uh, across the world. So I'm the early career chair for SCMR, and I was going to start uh, this question answer session by asking you a question that has come up. We all have been very excited with the new guidelines, the class one recommendations. And one of the questions, um, you know, our early career group is quite excited and motivated. Um, and I had uh, did I, I did a Twitter poll, almost 75 percent uh, uh, people answered saying that uh, uh, 44 percent of them at the advanced center in the United States. Uh, perform stress CMR. So as you can see, there is a large gap there and many of them are not performing. So those early career who are trying to, um, you know, establish the new stress CMR programs at their center, what's your advice to them? Particularly, as we know, um, you know, very few academic centers in the United States traditionally have given uh, training in stress uh, CMR. That's a good. That's a great question, Pervy, and I think it's such an important issue to to discuss. I think we're in a very exciting time, but also we it's important to know what are the limit what are the um, obstacles in uh, getting uh, 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 stress MRI in the clinical arena. And I think those obstacles are getting a dwindling to less and less. The one thing that has consistent as I build my own program, and I think many others on this panel can also speak to it, is familiarity by the clinician. There is not there is a lot to be said about getting a case refer and then would perform a, a case. You the uh, the local CMR person will establish a local expertise and demonstrate and work with the clinician uh, in especially in early cases in looking at the images together, understanding how decisions are made, understanding how reports are, are, are generated, what it means by having a stress perfusion defect, how we overlay stress perfusion over LGE, over uh, infoc imaging, to understand what we recommend jointly. Having the clinicians involved in, in the decision process, allow them to have a visual image of what is being decided upon. I think that's extremely important for clinicians to con continue to refer. The lack of familiarity is almost always the reason to not refer, it's not because they don't believe MRI can do a fantastic job. The second thing is really, is, is again, uh, having a efficient, efficient uh, high turnout output. And John alluded to, to this point about rapid protocol. Our stress protocol should be no less, should be, uh, succinct and so to be uh, to the point to uh, answer ischemic burden and infarct and it should be limited to uh, a, a short protocol uh, uh, that answer the question. So high success rate, consistent imaging analysis and reporting, those are the keys to success. Thank you, 
Thank you. So as you mentioned, repo, you know, establishing that repo with the referring is important. Now, if we look at the guidelines, all the stretch, uh, stress imaging modalities are lumped together as class one. How do you communicate uh, with the referring provider? Why do we need CMR? Yeah, I think that's, that's also uh, a um, ongoing uh, effort. We need to continue to uh, educate uh, not only our colleagues, but also uh, the, um, but also the um, as we develop further guidelines, we understand we have to highlight the strengths of CMR. That it is a, a tool without any radiation. It uh, it is very rapid, quantitative, and it certainly provides a, a wealth of other information. So I, I think that uh, uh, we have to highlight the fact that. Uh, this is a modality that should play a significant role, not the only tool that can look at ischemia. Uh, I would certainly would not stop at just saying that MRI should be a, only performed when you have multiple questions, when you have to look at quantitative uh, viability. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, pro promote that message because I think MRI is highly effective in any one of those regards, viability, uh, assessing function or even other components such as quantifying valvular uh, regurgitation. So I think we should make it clear the message that MRI by itself is actually uh, highly, highly accurate compared to other modalities as well. John, um, would love to get your insights on your approach to patients with acute chest pain um, and the timing of CMR, particularly those who are in the intermediate risk category. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. Um, we don't do a lot of um, ED investigation in the UK. So if patients come into the ED department uh, with chest pain, troponin negative, felt to be at low to intermediate risk, they're not automatically kept in and investigated with anatomical or functional imaging. Many of those are uh, put on to um, primary strict secondary prevention. So they may be started on aspirin, beta blocker, statin, and then reviewed um, a couple of weeks later to see to, if they're COVID, if they're troponin negative, to see whether they've still got symptoms and then to consider an invasive, uh, sorry, an investigation strategy for them. So for that group of patients, it's probably a little bit different to how it is in the US, I suspect. I, and I think, you know, <clears throat> sorry, I was just going to say, you know, the guidelines emphasize um, high sensitivity troponin as a really useful blood biomarker. Uh, and I uh, alert this group to the literature that's come out of Wake Forest University, uh, nice randomized trial evidence of intermediate test or intermediate risk chest pain patients in the ER. If we can, you know, coordinate our efforts and provide access, patients benefit better outcomes at lower cost. Yeah, I mean, it's just difficult, isn't it? Because, um, I mean, these patients are presenting 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it's whether you want the uh, MR department open to uh, <laughs> do a huge volume of work out of hours when you're already struggling with MR centers and trained physicians, I guess, to be able to do the elective work as well. So... <laughs> Although I'll, I'll point out, no one does a stress spec at two in the morning. So um, <laughs> somehow we figured out a solution. And that's, that's a good thing. Yes. <laughs> but we use MR a lot acutely in the UK when they've come in um, either through the ACS pathway and STEMI, STEMI patients, uh, particularly the primary PCI patients where there's no obvious culprit lesion. Um, so where it's a sort of Minoka type patient. And then the question is, has it been spontaneous reperfusion? Has the interventionist missed a small side branch that's occluded and therefore it is actually an infarct? Or is it myopericarditis, another form of cardiomyopathy, Takasubo, et cetera, et cetera. So we use it quite a lot in that scenario uh, for acute inpatients, but they're the sort of not, the, those are done sort of usually within sort of 24 hours, 36 hours, something like that, but they're not sort of patients who are in the ED department, certainly. But I can show you, I mean, following on from Ray's point, uh, just while we've got a gap in the conversation about, I think one of the important things that Ray said um, was that CMR is perceived to be a little bit sort of slow and cumbersome. And I can sort of show you just one really quick slide, if you like, um, to show that that's not necessarily the case. Um, 
So here's a small study that we did a couple of years ago, um, just looking at, at a, a rapid workflow. So um, we essentially did just stress first pass perfusion imaging, no rest perfusion imaging. That's based on data that uh, ourselves and other groups have published because um, you don't really need to do the rest perfusion imaging if you've got uh, good quality late gadolinium, gadolinium enhancement images. Um, and you can see here that if you just do a very simple protocol of long axis cines, uh, stress perfusion MR, whole coverage of the LV, and then early and late gadolinium enhancement by a very fast technique. I mean, this is a, this is a study whereby all of the patients were completed their exam in under 20 minutes. I mean, that's 20 minutes of on table time. So obviously there's a little bit of time in the department, but if you look at that compared to stress echo, to nuclear perfusion imaging around where you might have patients in the department for up to a couple of hours, maybe on two visits as well. Um, this, is, this is very, very rapid. And I, I think this actually makes uh, stress MR the fastest ischemia test that is available, or ischemia imaging test available. So I can stop sharing that. So very, very quick. Great, John. That, that answers one of the questions from the chat. I wanted us to have a quick fire round of answers for the remaining questions, or some of the remaining questions from the chat. Uh, um, Raymond, you mentioned about quantitative perfusion. Uh, this seems to be a research tool still. Um, what's your prediction? When will this be clinically available to anyone? My prediction it is going to be available um, soon, uh, maybe in the matter of uh, the next uh, year or, or a few or, or two. Uh, I think is is the tool that I, my understanding is the vendors are all working very hard to uh, to make it uh, feasible to to perform in uh, many centers. Uh, it is highly validated and is in fact. The, uh, the lack of need to perform complicated post-processing as has been as achieved in the last few years is so, certainly make it so useful uh, um, in, in, the practical set, in the practical setting. That, that, that's right. all now available and I think it will become uh, part of routine clinical care. Okay, to John, is there a role for dibutamine stress in the new guidelines? Yeah, that's a really good question actually. Um, and I think the, the evidence is actually quite limited uh, for dibutamine stress MR in terms of clinical trials. And actually it became quite difficult to consider it as a sort of separate, um, I guess a separate branch of uh, CMR ischemia testing. Um, I think, I mean, there was a sort of study by Iconagel sort of 20 years ago and now comparing to stress echo and showed that it had as good a, as, if not better, diagnostic accuracy. So that's all we really have in terms of uh, sort of head-to-head -head trials. So it, it couldn't really make a standalone recommendation. In that regard, though, I think as you can see that it's comparable or better than stress echo, then I guess you can extrapolate the stress echo literature to this dibutamine stress MR technique and say, well, Stress echo can see wall notion abnormalities under stress with dibutamine and so can CMR and maybe the contrast with CMR and wall note and endocardial border definition is even better. So why should it not be as good as stress echo or um, better than stress echo and therefore the same recommendations apply to it? Not the guidelines are such. Yeah. yeah, but there, there wasn't felt to be any specific guideline recommendation for dibutamine stress MR. Okay, we'll answer the other questions uh, in the text. Um, over back to Suba. Thank you, and thank you all for um, uh, an outstanding uh, session. I would remind everyone in attendance that this is the first in a series of four webinars. Uh, come back and join us again over the successive Mondays, same time, um, same uh, uh, Zoom access. Uh, this is being recorded. Share this with friends, families, neighbors in the next imaging lab over and uh, help them see the light. And importantly, do what you can to improve access to your patients. They need CMR, they'll benefit. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Suba. And with that, we must conclude today's webinar. You will soon receive an email from the SCMR with a link to the evaluation survey for this webinar. To register for any of our upcoming webinars or meetings or to view recordings of previous webinars, please visit www.scmr.org.
Thank you for your participation in today's webinar. We hope to see you here again soon. This concludes today's program. Thank you. We may not disconnect.